rationality rules did a video on macro evolution cannot occur debunked which I want to give a response to first I want to acknowledge that I'm a subscriber and I have nothing against Steven personally and this is not an attack on him but a refutation of his position let's start by laying down some groundwork beginning with definitions what exactly is the difference between evolution, microevolution, and macroevolution? Well, within evolutionary biology, evolution is defined as biological change over generations, and it encompasses both micro and macroevolution. Microevolution is biological change over generations within a species, and macroevolution is biological change over generations outside of a species, and that is the only difference. They both rely on exactly the same mechanisms, that being genetic mutation and natural selection. But this raises the immediate and very important question, what's the definition of a species? A species is defined as a group of individuals that are able to produce viable, fertile offspring. And so, for example, the Chihuahua and the Great Dane are the same species because they can successfully interbreed, despite their anatomic differences. Whereas the Asian elephant and the African elephant are two separate species because they can't successfully interbreed, despite their anatomic similarities. Now microevolution, that being biological change over generations within a species, is supported by overwhelming evidence, and it's accepted by almost everyone, including the most scientifically illiterate of creationists. Hell, even Kent Hovind accepts it. Now that one happens. I think animals can produce a whole variety of offspring. You know, long hair, short hair, long-legged, short-legged. That happens. But macroevolution, that being biological change over generations outside of a species, or speciation, is not accepted by creationists, despite the fact that it's also supported by overwhelming evidence. This is a textbook example of an equivocation fallacy. First, Stephen states that Microevolution is biological change within a species, and that macroevolution is biological change outside of a species. But then he turns and conflates macroevolution and speciation, which is sort of like reshuffling the deck. It actually reminds me of the traveling magician with the deck of cards. You can see all the cards that are all different, all right? The reason why I say that is because sometimes people think I'm using fake cards. All right. All right, so look, you take any one, pick a card, any card, show the guys, show the camera. I won't look. Okay, chuck it here. Okay, watch closely, okay? Here's what's gonna happen. Okay, this was obviously, this wasn't the card. Was it, was it, was it red? It was it, it was it. Place out your forefinger like this. Yeah, turn it over. Like that. Place it on top of the card right here. Okay. Place it right here. Yeah. Now, it, obviously your card was it was red, you said, right? Yep. Okay. I want you to think of the 9 here, but I want you to think of the it changing to the number. Was it a number card? Or was it a Jack Queen King Ace? No. Okay. It was this was like Jack Queen King Ace. Okay. I want you to think of the, the just changing. Push a little bit harder, push a little bit harder here. Right, now, turn the card over. <laughs> How come? Hmm. Speciation is actually changes that happen within a species, which cause the species to no longer be interfertile. And as a result, you get what taxonomists classify as two distinct species. But don't get it confused, the changes occur within the species, so that would actually fit Stephen's definition of microevolution and not macroevolution. Here's an analogy. You have two little boys counting some change. The older boy says, I only want the dollars. The little boy says, I only want the pennies. The little boy counts up a hundred pennies, and the big boy takes them and says, ah, here's my dollar. In the case of the two boys, the little boy's coins are pennies. They become a dollar once they reach a hundred. Only at that last moment do they become a dollar. In the case of speciation, the changes happen within the species and only reach the level of speciation 
at that last moment when they can no longer interbreed. Here's an example. Before we explain speciation, let's talk about what we mean when we use the word species. According to the classic definition, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other groups. Speciation begins when groups become separated in space or become different enough in form and behavior that individuals from one group no longer regularly mate with individuals outside the group. When a few individuals colonize a new area that is outside their native range. Take, for example, a volcanic island that rises out of the sea just off the coast of the mainland. As the island grows larger and less volcanically active, plants begin to grow, but there are no birds here yet. Then one day, birds from a common species on the mainland are blown over by a storm and start a new population. If these birds move between the island and the mainland only rarely, the conditions for reproductive isolation are set and the brand new island population is on its way to becoming a new species. Over thousands of generations, the two populations will be shaped by natural and sexual selection into separate forms, each with a unique genetic fingerprint. But at what point are we confident that this island population has really changed enough to become a new species? Well, let's put our definition to the test. If we introduce a female from the mainland species to a potential mate from the island after 200 generations in isolation, about 400 years in bird terms, will they mate? It appears that these two still recognize each other as members of the same species. How about after another thousand generations of isolation? Now, the female finds this island male's song a bit strange, but she still chooses to mate with him. What if we fast forward again to 10,000 generations of isolation? This time, the female doesn't even recognize the male song and is completely uninterested. If this female's mating preferences are widespread in the population, we now have two bona fide species, mainland and island. So my question would be, when did the changes take place that led to speciation? While they were the same species, meaning within species, or after they were a distinct species, according to the definition given in the video? I would say that, according to Stephen's own definition, this would be microevolution. When Stephen was conflating macroevolution and speciation, he said that creationists don't accept speciation, which is incorrect. Even conservative creationists such as Answers in Genesis agree that speciation occurs. In his debate with Bill Nye, Ken Ham says, when it comes to finches, we actually would agree as creationists that different finch species came from a common ancestors. But a finch is what that would have to come from. And so, before we move on, I'm going to present just two examples. The first is the greenish warbler, a ring species that's been generously covered by Holy Kool-Aid within one of my other videos. Evidently, this bird originated in the southern Himalayas and expanded over generations east and west around the mountains, and along the way they evolved, or adapted, to their new environments. By the time they met up north of the mountains, however, they had evolved, or adapted, to such a degree that they could no longer successfully reproduce. They were, and are, by definition, a different species. And the second example that I'll give is cuddly rabbits. Just as humans have artificially bred a multitude of dogs, so too have they bred a multitude of rabbits. But while all dog breeds can successfully reproduce, the same can't be said of all rabbit breeds. 
Namely, the Alaska and Florida rabbit can't successfully reproduce. They can both reproduce with other breeds, but they can't reproduce with one another. They are, by definition, a different species. They are an example of macroevolution. Anyhow, to get back on topic, with the evidence for speciation being overwhelming, the argument is over, no? Yes, the argument is over. In the book, The Scientific Approach to Evolution, Rob Stadler showed six criteria for high confidence science. Number one, that is repeatable. Two, directly measurable and accurate results. Three, prospective interventional study. Four, careful to avoid bias. Five, careful to avoid assumptions. And six, sober judgment of results. He also shows six criteria for low confidence science. Number one, not repeatable. Two, indirectly measured, extrapolated, or inaccurate results. Three, retrospective observational study. Four, clear opportunities for bias. Five, many assumptions required. And six, overstated confidence or scope of results. The overwhelming evidence, which is cited most often from evolutionists, is either low confidence evidence, such as the fossil record, radiometric dating, homology, bad design, and biogeography. Or the evidence supports microevolution, which is irrefutable and accepted by both evolutionists and creationists. And so it's no wonder that people will try to move speciation under macroevolution, but that's just not the case. If you like this video, please subscribe and click the bell to get notifications when I release new videos.